Guys are getting their, their testosterone levels checked and they're not even checking free, they're just doing total. And they're at the lower end of this range and they're being told by their primary medical doctor, yeah, you're fine, you're, God, I hate the word normal. Um, when they're not, they're not optimized, they're not where they need to be. Diving right in, what are what you say are the main controllable factors that are negatively impacting men's testosterone levels today? Yeah, so great, great way to start off the conversation. We're experiencing what I call this testosterone epidemic where levels are plummeting worldwide. And we're seeing free tea, which we'll talk about the bioavailable form is probably almost half what it was 20, 30 years ago. And so when you look at what are the modifiable factors, things that you can control, the biggest one without question is toxins in our environment. So it's called endocrine disruptors, which is basically any chemical, any toxin that can affect hormone production or hormone function. Some of those common sources of it are our food that we're eating. So the, the chemicals in our food, the chemicals sprayed in our crops, the chemicals that uh, the animals that we're eating are eating. Uh, we could look at our water and our drinking supply and all the chemicals and synthetic estrogen that's in our water supply. We can look at our personal care products, things like our laundry detergent, our soap, shampoo, sunscreen, deodorant, etc., that are full of chemicals. And studies have shown that these chemicals are crushing testosterone production, testosterone uh, function as well. And so uh, some of the things that you can do is, is first and foremost, mitigate or eliminate those exposures. And mm. so we could look at, I know you talk a lot about nutrition and clean food and, you know, it's focusing on organic fruits and vegetables and staying away from um, the refined packaged processed foods, which we know are laden with all of these chemicals. We can look at our water and be sure that we are drinking clean water. You know, studies have shown that synthetic estrogen, women's birth control, is actually in our drinking supply at massive levels. Wow. And, and so we need to be filtering our water because those estrogenic compounds are, it's like glue on that light switch where it's uh, sticking to our androgen receptors, turning them on where they never turn off and it crushes testosterone function. Wow, so even if even if the, the androgens are there, the signal is not being heard by the cells That's because right. the receptors are being That's right, it's up. altering the receptor function as well. Whoa. Yeah, and so filtering your water. So you can install a water filter in your sink, you can install it for your whole house. You can be sure that you're drinking from uh, stainless steel water bottles or glass and not using any plastic you know plastic water bottles are one of the biggest sources of uh, of chemicals in our water and so insisting on never drinking from a plastic water bottle insisting that you're filtering your water are easy things that any guy can do today hmm. there have yeah. been headlines recently new studies have shown that uh water in plastic bottles contains million billions of right. nano of uh, right. of nanoplastics and the like yeah so plastic water bottles are made with uh, chemicals uh, phthalates and bpa most commonly and both of those are chemicals which will leach into your water especially when it's warm you think of these pallets of water bottles that are sitting outside getting warm and then we're drinking them and they're loaded with plastics they're loaded with chemicals and so it's important that we do everything we can to mitigate that exposure yeah, yeah i mean i like to think about it like you know you you may think that you're buying bottled water in plastic from the refrigerator of your local bodega or supermarket or convenience store. And and the real issue, I think, is when the water is heated in the context of plastic. But you don't know how that plastic has been stored, that plastic water bottle right. has been stored prior to it reaching the fridge at your convenience store or bodega, right? Exactly. It could have been sitting in a truck, you know, in the desert heat for days, if not weeks, before making it to the store. So you, you ultimately have no idea. The best way to ensure that the water that you're drinking is, or one of the one of the ways to ensure that the water is clean is to make sure that you're buying it in glass, you know? Exactly, exactly. Or just filter it, get a good quality filter for the home. You know, you need a carbon block filter and reverse osmosis is great as well, but the carbon block is the key aspect mm. of the filter that's gonna get rid of those estrogenic compounds. Interesting. Yeah. Is so. What are the primary chemicals then? Because we've we've used the word, you know, uh, any any scientifically literate person listening to this, and you know, we have many in in our audience, is going to say, well, everything's a chemical. So, what are the specific chemicals that, yeah. that I think we ought to be m most mindful of? Sure. So, uh, you can look at um, our food and chemicals such as atrazine. So, atrazine is an herbicide. It's a it's a weed killer that's sprayed in our crops, especially in the Midwest, and uh, it's found in massive levels in uh, your urine and it's from the food we're eating. And so insisting on organic 
fruits and vegetables. Uh, making sure that you're eating uh, grass-fed organic meat uh, is a way that you could eliminate or mitigate at least exposure to things like atrazine. Uh, BPA and phthalates we talked about already. Uh, BPA is how you make plastics. Phthalates is how you make plastics bendy and flexible. And so uh, we can also look at our, our uh, food containers, food storage, uh, and make sure that we're not uh, keeping our food, especially if we're going to heat it up, not use any of these plastic food containers as well. Um, we can look at um, our personal care products, and there are ways that we can actually identify all of the chem- There's dozens, if not hundreds, of these chemicals that are in things like laundry detergent and sunscreen and deodorant. And there are apps on your phone that are free that you can use to go to the store and scan barcodes, and it'll show you the list of all of these chemicals that are in your products that you would otherwise not know. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I definitely do my best. I mean, I buy yeah. unscented laundry detergent. Mm-hmm. I use, you know, I mean, my skincare routine is pretty minimalist as it is. But I use, I buy soaps that are that don't have artificial fragrances in them. I do my best to buy, you know, to bring only grass fed meat into my house. But how do you strike a balance? Like you're on the road a lot, right? You're giving talks all over the world on this topic. You're yeah. no doubt eating in restaurants. You're no sure. doubt. You know, I'm, I'm sure if you're human, you've found yourself thirsty at an airport. Right. So what do you do in those kinds of instances? You do the best you can. Recognizing that no one's perfect, recognizing that you can't live in a bubble your whole life. And so you do the best you can. And so like, for example, when I travel, that's the time when I fast. And I know you talk a lot about intermittent fasting and the benefits of that. Um, when you travel, that's the time to fast unless you could be sure that you have good quality foods with you that you uh, can trust the ingredients. And so that's a big way. Um, when you uh, do eat out, that's that's really uh, the time to focus on um, the restaurant you're you're gonna you're gonna go to and look at the foods that you're eating and, and really insist on quality and you know most fast food in general is gonna be poor quality and so you need to 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 plan and be strategic about those situations knowing that they're gonna come up and and you could avoid it uh, for the most part but yeah no one's perfect you, you can't live in a bubble yeah you can't live yeah. in a bubble I think we can't we can't let perfect be the enemy of the good I mean That's I was right. on the road recently because I do a lot of talks around the world as well. I was in Sun Valley and uh, it was late at night. Everything closed by everything was closed by 9 p.m. So I had somebody mm-hmm. who was who I was working with there, like one of my, you know, one of my points of contact, go to a local restaurant and bring me. I didn't know what the, I was just like, bring me a lean piece of meat and some kind of, you know, starch, like a, a potato with nothing mm-hmm. on it. Right. And some grilled vegetables. And they brought it to me and it was like in a styrofoam container. And I had no idea where the meat came from. I don't you know, know about the organic status of the or convention, you know. Of the of the produce that I was eating, but I was happy to eat it because I felt like that was, you know, I didn't obviously I don't want to go hungry, and I know that lean protein is like the benefits outweigh any risks, right? Sure. Um, if you're con- if you're really focus focusing primarily on controlling the controllables, yeah, it's about imperfect action. You know, yeah. it's about doing something, taking those little baby steps every day, and um, you know, I, I talk about living with intention and how you have to take that first step, and that's going to uh, create momentum to create the next step. And these tiny habits, as BJ Fogg talks about, build upon themselves, and mm-hmm. that's how you're gonna gonna create habit change is one little step at a time. Yeah, one little step at a time. That's right. What about can you t- what can you tell us about the statistics regarding testosterone levels in the U.S.? I know that. Yeah. I mean, we hear about this all the time, but maybe you can put some numbers sure. to the, the the widespread testosterone decline that we're yeah. now seeing. Yeah. So the the best study out there was the male Massachusetts aging study. Hmm. Great longitudinal study, and it simply followed men for over twenty years, and they looked at lab values, specifically testosterone. And what they found over twenty years was that the total testosterone level dropped quite a bit. And specifically, the free testosterone was about 45% lower in age-matched controls. So what that means is you take a 50-year-old guy today and his free testosterone, the bioavailable active form of testosterone, is almost half what it was 20 years ago. Hmm. Crazy. There are two other longitudinal studies in Europe, one in Sweden and one in Finland, uh, between 20 and 30-year, again, longitudinal trials where they simply followed lab numbers, found the same exact thing as well. And so it's not limited to the US, uh, it's worldwide, and uh, it's, a, it's a massive decline. And, and I wanna emphasize that men tend to think of testosterone as all about you know, sex and building muscle, but testosterone is critically important when it comes to things like cardiovascular health. You know, we know that, that men with low testosterone have about a 30% increased risk of a major adverse cardiac event 
compared to men with higher optimized testosterone levels. Wow. 30% difference. We know that men with low testosterone have a worsened insulin sensitivity, which means blood sugar regulation. We know that men with low testosterone have uh, increased markers of inflammation, higher LDL numbers, which I know you've, you've talked about in the past on, on other episodes. Um, we see that men with low testosterone have issues with a cognitive decline and poor cognitive function and focus, memory, concentration, uh, mood. It affects body composition, obviously ability to burn visceral fat. And so it's not just about aesthetics. It's not just about sex. It's about really a man's health. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so important. A lot of times when the topic of converse, of testosterone comes up, the emphasis is primarily primarily placed on free testosterone as mm -hmm. compared to total. What's the difference right. between the two? Sure. So testosterone is this hormone floating around in your bloodstream. And for it to have any actual effect, any physiologic effect, it needs to bind to a receptor on the surface of a muscle cell, for example. And when it binds to that androgen receptor on the surface of the muscle, it's going to then create a cascade of signals within that cell. It's going to go to the nucleus of the cell, the, the, the brains of that cell, and then affect DNA transcription to ultimately affect outcome. Well, if testosterone is bound to proteins in the bloodstream, it can no longer bind to the androgen receptor and no longer have any effect thereafter. And so there are proteins in the bloodstream, specifically sex hormone binding globulin or SHBG most commonly, that will bind to testosterone. And now you have this big fluffy molecule that can no longer bind to the androgen receptor and have any effect. And so what we care about is the free testosterone, which is specifically that testosterone, which is not bound to those proteins and can thus bind to the androgen receptor and have its effect. Hmm. And so that's why we care so much about free T. And so a lot of guys will get uh, testosterone levels checked, a total testosterone, and that's fairly worthless in relation to a free testosterone, which is actually the bioavailable or active form of the hormone. Interesting. Can yeah. I run my numbers by you? Of course. Yeah, so I use uh, Life Force. Listeners of my podcast know that I'm a huge fan of Life Force. Very easy to do. They send a phlebotomist to your house. And so I have actually, I've done a number of tests um, over the past uh, two years or so. And I've actually always had very high total testosterone. Um, so my testosterone in January of 2023, so uh, one year ago, was 1,152 nanograms per deciliter. Nice. So just over 1,100. Okay. And I'm 40, I was uh, 40 years old okay. at the time. Sure. I'm 41 now. Yeah. I did a bit of a uh, fat loss diet um, just after those labs were drawn. Okay. And so my dietary fat plummeted. It, I wasn't on a, like a no fat diet, but I was eating a lot less dietary fat, a lot less calories overall. And my total testosterone subsequently dropped to about 700, um, in June of 2023. Okay. And I haven't tested since. Okay. I would assume that they're back up because if, and actually maybe you can help me understand, would they have gone back up, you know, after, after, uh, you know, returning to my normal diet? Um, I'm not sure because I haven't tested since then, but I did see a drop when I reduced my dietary fat intake. Okay. And then my free testosterone, January 2023, 20, was 178. Okay. Um, these are all in the like the green sure. level according yeah. to Life Force, right? Yeah. But then as a result of my fat loss phase, went down to 113. So I definitely saw a drop. Interesting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what do you think of those numbers? Sure. So I think it, it's important to, to first take a step back and talk about the ranges, the reference intervals, reference range that you see on these lab slips. Because traditional doctors, when I went to medical school and training, were taught, look at that reference interval. And if you're in that window, then you're fine. You're, you're normal. A reference range is just like the average like, you know, bell curve for the, for the exactly lab. Exactly right? right. That's right. So for free testosterone or total testosterone, they will look at the average, the median of the billion tests that they do. And then statistically two standard deviations above and below will give you this wide range. Well, the total testosterone range and the free T range is massive. Like what was the one on yours there? My total was, uh, the, in the, re the reference range. Oh, the reference range. Yeah. Is there a reference range? Let's see. Yeah, that green range you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. you know, it doesn't actually give me numbers. It's just, it's, okay. it's graphic. Yeah. yeah, so it's this massive range. You may hear a total testosterone range of 240 to 1200, for example. Actually, wait, I stand corrected. There okay. is a range. So okay. between 750 to 1200 is optimal. Okay according to the life force okay. reference range. Yeah. And, 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 and I like that representation. If you look at traditional lab core quests, you know, you go through standard medical uh, labs, 
you will have this wide, wide range that goes from the very low end to the average to higher range. Um, the problem with that is that that is the average of the population. And we just went through the literature that shows us that that average, that that number has dropped almost 50% in the last 20 years. Mm. And so that bell curve that you're talking about has literally shifted to the left over the last 20 years. Not exactly something you want to aspire to to be no, average, exactly. right? right? And so guys are getting their, their testosterone levels checked and they're not even checking free, they're just doing total. And they're at the lower end of this range and they're being told by their primary medical doctor, yeah, you're fine, you're, a guy, I hate the word normal. Um, when they're not, they're not optimized, they're not where they need to be. Mm, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And so from a free testosterone standpoint, yeah, I'm actually below, I'm actually, in June 2023, I was actually below, You're below. optimal. Yeah. Yeah. 113 so, yep. picograms per milliliter, I guess. That's right. Yeah. And, and typically, the target for free testosterone is going to be around, two, in that scale, and uh, there are different labs, a lot of different scales, mm -hmm. around 200, give or take. Mm -hmm. And so the lab, the free tea you had last January was great. Hmm. You said it was 180. Yeah, it was 180. Yeah. 180. The 113 is what I tend to see a lot of when guys come in off the street is mm -hmm. in that range. And they're being told they're normal when they're not. They're being told that they're okay when they're not. And and that's that's going to have a, a, an, a clinically significant effect on a daily, weekly, monthly, year-long basis wow. with low T levels like that. Well, I can tell you exactly what I was doing that caused that drop. And the drop... If, and, and I recall very clearly because I was monitoring this very closely, I didn't see any reduction in my libido. I didn't see my body composition actually dramatically shifted toward the positive. I was on a fat loss phase. So I was deliberately, I deliberately dialed down my dietary fat intake. So I can tell you exactly why it dropped. Sure. Um, so from a dietary standpoint, clearly are, at least in my own N of one anecdotal experience, testosterone levels, both free and total, highly responsive to diet. So from a dietary standpoint, how should we be eating then as a result? How should we be eating to, to optimize our testosterone levels yeah. as men? So common question, complicated answer. There's this, this one size fits all mentality where tell me the perfect diet, what do I got to eat? And I'll eat that diet to get my testosterone levels perfectly where they are. And I like to say one size fails all because everyone's different. Mm. Everyone's unique. Uh, your genetics are different. How you're going to respond to, to diet, to exercise, to stress, to sleep is going to vary so much. And so when we look at that uh, change that you're talking about, we have to understand that first of all, testosterone levels can vary on a, on a daily basis, actually. And even, even what time of day you measure, it can affect that as well. Wow. We know that there are a lot of other variables besides just what you were eating. So one of the biggest ones is stress, you know, our stress hormone called cortisol crushes testosterone mm. and so when we are stressed and and most of the high performers i work with will tell me no i'm not stressed and i, I say nonsense we're all, we're all stressed to a certain degree but that stress that cortisol is crushing at, at the brain level production of testosterone wow and so we have to also look at you know how, what's your sleep like what's your exercise are you overtraining? are you sleeping properly are you getting the right micronutrients uh at, rather than just simply um assigning uh, the the low fat had to be the cause of that. Certainly there's an association, but there's so many other variables that can certainly come into play. We know that testosterone is a steroid hormone and it's actually made from cholesterol. So cholesterol is good, it's needed for cell membranes, it's needed for uh, steroid hormone production, it's the precursor to DHEA, which is a really important hormone as well. Testosterone, which gets metabolized into estradiol. And those are all three important hormones. And so we definitely need to have uh, good, healthy cholesterol levels. The question is, does dietary cholesterol necessarily equate to system-wide cholesterol that's available for testosterone production? And actually, the answer is probably not. There's, there's probably not uh, any clear, direct role that eating cholesterol necessarily affects testosterone production. But again, there's so many other variables, and this is where we have to recognize that everyone's different and understand that you know we need to take a very individualized approach for that reason. Do we know if cholesterol-lowering medications have an, a subsequent impact on T levels? They definitely do. Yes, when we you know we talk about statins and all the harms and all the negative side effects and and the downstream um, problems that, that they can cause. One of the biggest ones is that they do in fact lower testosterone. Wow. They do in fact obviously 
uh, worse than blood sugar regulation, you know, that cause insulin resistance and all the other problems that you've talked about in other shows. And so, yes, uh, when guys start statins, we definitely do see a, a drop in testosterone. Wow, very interesting. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I can tell you exactly how I was eating when my testosterone levels were at their peak. I was eating lots of ribeyes, very, you know, fairly fatty meat on a, on a, mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Yeah. Not to the degree that I was over consuming. I, you know, I was not, I was never overweight. But I was just, you know, I had a very, uh, um, my attitude towards towards dietary fat was just super liberal, you know, pouring mm -hmm. extra virgin olive oil on, you know, on pretty much anything that I could, you know, get to fit on my plate. <laughs> and um, yeah, ribeyes and ribs and things like that, which are all, I think, great foods, but, you know, uh, the dietary fat can add up. And so when I, when I undertook this, like, you know, this goal of trying to reach sub 10% body fat, you know, dietary fat was the first place I looked to kind sure. of like, you know, snip, sure. snip. And something that's really powerful is genetics and how genetics really come into play when it comes to nutrition and changes and, and you know, all these ridiculous, these comical Twitter battles of, of what's the perfect diet. And yeah. the answer is that there's no perfect diet and genetics really affect that. So for example, you mentioned uh, animal fats. We know that genetics have a direct role in how your body responds to saturated fats, for example. And so we know the APOE gene, we know PPAR gamma and other genes that are related to how our bodies process saturated fat is different for each of us. And that's going to affect our response to that. So for some people, saturated fats, uh, if you're eating more than 5% of your daily caloric intake as saturated fats, they may actually be harmful. Whereas other people can eat up to 10% and have no problem whatsoever. Hmm. And so I, I never like to, to pigeonhole down to one absolute perfect diet. I like to use data to help drive that and decide what's right for each of us. Yeah, I don't have a huge authority bias, but the American Heart Association, what do they recommend? About 10%, 10% or fewer uh, as a percentage of calories from saturated fat? In general, they say under 10%. Um, uh, you know, they say avoid red meat, avoid eggs, avoid dairy and all this. And um, and there's nuance that needs to be understood with that. Yeah. Well, people don't understand that there, that lean red meat exists and lean red meat Lean red meat isn't necessarily fat free, right? There's still plenty of fat on right. a filet mignon, which is which qualifies as being sure. as lean, right? Sure. You get top sirloin steak, which I know my friend Stan, Stan Efferding, bodybuilder, world's strongest bodybuilder, he's a huge fan of. And these are all lean sources of red meat. Sure. So for anybody who is concerned that they might be over consuming saturated fat, that doesn't mean that you have to cut out all red meat. Right. You know, that's just, that's dogma. The truth is that lean red meats exist and they're delicious, they're tender, they're tasty, and they have just enough fat in it to be satiating and provide the backbone for you know these all these other processes that create your hormones and the like. Sure, sure. And a lot of it's quality as well. You know, what's the quality of the protein that you're eating? What's the quality of that meat source, for example, or that fish or uh, whatever animal source of protein you may be getting? And I, I think a lot of it comes down to, and I know you speak about this as well, uh, not necessarily what you're eating, but what you're not eating. Hmm. And when you can eliminate the processed refined foods, when you're eliminating the... Um, um, the muffins when you're eliminating the packaged products and focusing more on the clean foods, um, that's already going to move the needle. And then you can refine it again based on genetics and data and understanding, you know, tracking blood sugar and tracking other markers to see how you respond to those foods. But there's so much that we can do by just simply eliminating the stuff that we know across the board is going to be bad for us. Are there any foods or supplements that um, can actually help to boost testosterone? Great question. So when it comes to testosterone, we know that uh, things like zinc and magnesium and B vitamins are certainly uh, important um, when it comes to testosterone production. So any foods that are going to provide those micronutrients are really key. We know that uh, when you're eating a higher protein diet, you're going to be more in an anabolic state and you're going to be better able to produce those hormones as well. We know that sugar, we know that refined processed sugar especially, is going to uh, obviously promote inflammation, obviously stimulate uh, our stress hormone cortisol levels to be higher, and that's going to suppress testosterone production. So without question, the foods that we're eating can directly affect testosterone. What are some foods that are high in zinc? Great question. Um, Oysters, I think, are good. Um, beyond that, I can't actually tell you. Oysters are like a top source. 
Yeah. Oysters are one of nature's like yeah, yeah. multivitamins. Beyond that, I can't tell you other foods that are that are high in zinc actually now that you now that you bring that up. Well, aside from oysters, I, I know that animal source foods in general tend sure. to be good sources of highly bioavailable zinc. Yeah. I couldn't tell you beyond oysters what are you know, I couldn't rank them for yeah. you. Yeah. But I know that animal source foods are generally yeah. considered a, a, a really good source. What about supplements? So supplements in general are not going to be great for boosting testosterone. You'll see these commercials, you'll see these ads for all these tea boosters and, uh, you know, things like boron stuff like that. That's been shown to perhaps raise testosterone slightly. I find it comes back to the, the fundamentals. The key thing, you know, when, when a guy's looking to, to, let's say your testosterone was 113, like you mentioned, and, and you're like, doc, I don't, I don't want testosterone therapy. I want to start with the natural stuff. Absolutely. Let's talk about ways that we can do that. Strength training. We know that that resistance training, heavy muscle, uh, heavy weights with big muscle bellies, such as quads, hamstring, core, back, uh, those are the the key drivers when it comes to resistance training. Uh, optimizing sleep, not just quantity of sleep, but quality of sleep, meaning looking at deep sleep, looking at REM sleep, and making sure we're getting that key restorative sleep that we need. Reducing stress, lowering those cortisol levels. We know that sunlight, especially in the morning, can increase testosterone levels. There have been actually three studies that have shown that sunlight to the scrotum can boost testosterone levels. So guys get out there and nude sunbathe in the morning for 15 minutes. And, Sun and your balls. That's right. Absolutely. There's actual science to this. There is. There, there are a couple of studies that have shown that that does have an effect. Wow. Now, all of these things that I'm talking about are great and we should be doing them anyway. And yes, they may boost testosterone levels, but how much? And so if you did all those religiously uh, on a, a daily, regular, consistent basis for six months, that 113, I see that get up to maybe 130, 140. Hmm. Wow. Great. Is the testosterone decline that typically occurs over the course of aging for a male, is that quote unquote normal? Like, does that have to occur or is that just the norm today? It, it is the norm in the fact that I, I it, I would say almost it's very rare to see a guy coming off the street with a, a free tea of 180 like yours. That's very rare, and, and I, that that really honors how hard you work at it, obviously. Most guys are not doing that. And so I would say across the board, almost every guy I see off the street, if they haven't been on TRT or, or haven't been focused on, on addressing it, they'll have very, very low levels. And this is why I call it an epidemic. And and. Uh, we talked about the causes of it, the, the toxins and the stress and, and, and the, you know, sedentary lifestyle and, and the obesity that we're dealing with contributes to it as well. And, and, and all of these multi, multiple factors that come into play. There's also, unfortunately, this transgenerational effect that I think is worth just mentioning. And, and I don't want to be all doom and gloom here, but there are studies that show a transgenerational epigenetic effect. What that means is the exposures, the lifestyle, the environment of our parents and our grandparents affect us. Hmm. So epigenetics is basically how the science of how our lifestyle and environment and behaviors uh, affects our genetic expression by leaving marks on the, our DNA, if you will. We know that studies have shown that uh, exposures to toxins from our grandparents affected germ cells, sperm, which then affected our fathers. Their exposures affected us as well, and our exposures will affect our children as well. And so it's scary to think about how the daily decisions we make today are going to affect our children and their children and so on. And so we have a responsibility to recognize that and honor that and be sure that we're doing everything we can to, again, eliminate those exposures, eliminate those toxins and doing, doing everything that we can on a daily basis. Um, and so this is why I think it's an epidemic. And there's very little awareness of it that, you know, what typically happens is a guy has... Uh, no idea he has issues with low testosterone. Forget the fact that he's obese. He has high blood pressure. He has insulin resistance or you know early stages of diabetes. Um, forget the fact that his health is a mess. But when sex starts to decline, suddenly, ah, I need testosterone and just give me a shot. Hmm. Instead of addressing all those underlying problems that are at play. Yeah. You know, there are, with regard to mental health, there are staggering statistics that men really seem to be bearing the brunt of the mental health epidemic. Obviously, everybody everybody yeah. ha has the capacity to be affected by it, but um, but suicidality among young men, I think, is way higher, way orders of magnitude higher yeah. than for women. Do you think that that hormones are potentially playing a role here? Yeah, for sure. You know, so we can look at what are the things that are moving the needle when it comes to cognitive function. Certainly, hormones come into play. 
We know that uh, men with low testosterone have issues with mood, issues with depression, issues with cognitive function and memory and focus. We can also look at a lot of things that are not necessarily talked about in men's health, like gut health. I know you've had other shows looking at this. We know that the gut speaks to the brain. And we know that through the vagus nerve, through stress, uh, but also through hormones that are produced in the gut directly affect the brain. We know that things like nitric oxide is produced in the gut. We know serotonin comes from the gut. You know, GLP-1, you know, the, our, our body's natural semaglutide is actually made in the gut. And so understanding that connection as well, understanding how in general men are struggling with massive levels of stress and they don't want to necessarily acknowledge it or recognize it because it's a sign of weakness and so we just bury it and we go about our life and and there's no balance anymore you know i i ask these high performers you know what do you do for fun and i swear half of them will say work hmm. that's that's their fun is work and so it's the stress, it's the toxins in our environment, it's the diet, it's the gut health issues, it's the hormones, it's all of it put together that's ultimately affecting things like mental health. It's the entire exposome. I love the term. Yeah. You know, the, 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 ex, the concept of the exposome, the sum cumulative effect of all the various exposures. You know, it's not just one thing here and there. It's like, it's like everything, you know? It's, a, it's like death by, it's like Chinese water torture. You know, death or sure. death by a thousand cuts. Sure. You know, it's not just one thing. Like if it was just, you know, the occasional plastic water, drinking out of the occasional plastic water bottle, then, you know, then big deal. But it's like, it's everything. It's our ultra processed diets. It's our sedentary lifestyles. It's the chronic stress. It's like the innumerable industrial chemicals that we're exposed to on a chronic basis from the time that we're gametes to the time that we, you know, pass. It's just, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. The I, world that we've inherited. I can't agree with you more. And I think that's, uh, in my opinion, one of the big problems with men's health specifically today. Men's health comes through this lens of testosterone and the blue pill. Guys have issues. It must be low T or let me try some Viagra. Hmm. Instead of recognizing what you just pointed out, that it's a lot of things that come together. And for each guy, it's different. You know, I call it blind spots in our health. Blind spots are things that are uh, either holding us back or they're lurking under the surface waiting to cause problems. You know, I like to share this example that drives us home. Bob Harper, the head fitness trainer on the TV show, The Biggest Loser. At age 51, he's in the best shape of his life, right? He had a heart attack. 2017, age 51, he almost died from a, a heart attack and wow. he ended up having surgery and he recovered. And he talked about in interviews afterwards how there were things going on in my body that I wasn't aware of. And I think that drives home the point that diet and exercise are so important and there's so much more that we need to pay attention to as well. And it's hormones, it's gut health, it's stress, it's sleep, it's all these other factors that come into play. And this, you know, the, all these exposures, this exposome that you mentioned, I, I think that's really what it's all about. Hmm. Some people are taking Viagra as a pre-workout. Are you familiar with this? Yeah, so uh, a lot of guys do that and I, I'm not opposed to that. Uh, you know, low dose Cialis, low dose Viagra. The reason, Why, how might that help? Yeah, so they're, they're basically uh, chemically increasing your nitric oxide levels. And nitric oxide is one of over 50 hormones that we look at in men. Um, and it's incredibly important. I know you had another great episode on looking all at nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a vasodilator, meaning it increases blood flow. It increases blood flow to the genitals, obviously, which is why it does its job. It also increases blood flow to the brain. And this is why some guys get a headache when they take it because of that in increased vasodilation. Uh, but you're also increasing blood flow to the muscle. And when you're working out, that's, that's why guys like that benefit because you're increasing blood flow to where you really need, uh, need it and want it during a workout. Super interesting. Yeah, yeah I, um, I think my, my middle brother actually tried that as, a, as an experiment. He said he had a fantastic pump. Yes. People, I think, have this misconception that Viagra, that it, you take it and it causes arousal. It doesn't cause arousal. It just makes you more responsive Correct. to uh, an arousing stimulus. That's right. right. So it's not like your people are taking Viagra, going to the gym and walking around pitching a tent the whole time, right? <laughs> That's right. It increases sensitivity to stimulation. It's not going to create an auto erection. That's right. Got it. Interesting. Yeah. yeah I haven't tried that, but, um, you know, sounds interesting, like an interesting experiment. Not endorsing it, but... Um, yeah, man, it's super interesting. What about from the standpoint of the of testicular health? 
you know, like um, anything that we can do there in terms of procuring better health to our, you know, to the family jewels. Sure. So there have been studies looking at fertility. And what's interesting, uh, there's a great study at Israel that showed that uh, in the same time span, we've seen testosterone levels plummet by nearly 50%. Sperm counts, motility, and fertility in general have declined by nearly 50% as well. And so we understand the connection there is that that all comes from the testicles. And so your sperm and your testosterone both come from adequate testosterone or testicular function. And so when it comes to all the things that guys don't want to focus on, the lifestyle stuff, the nutrition, the stress, the sleep, and the mindset work, all of those through the science of epigenetics are going to directly affect testicular health. And so it's about our health and our quality of life and our longevity for sure, but it's also about what we're passing on to our children and other generations as well. Hmm. Yeah. Is underwear, you know, good for the good for the family jewels or no? Should we all be free balling? Yeah. So the, there have been studies looking at briefs versus boxers, and they have found that when you're wearing briefs, that um, you are bringing the testicles closer to the body, and so you're increasing the temperature of the testicles by as much as a half a degree. Wow. And that doesn't sound like very much, but it's actually a lot when it comes to sperm function. And so, uh, for men who are having issues with fertility, that's something that you can look at doing is being sure that you're not wearing those tight briefs. Yeah. Very tight briefs, yeah. 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 Boxer, boxer brief guy here, um, but yeah, definitely, definitely a concern. You know, yeah. I like having the support of wearing boxer briefs, sure. but not at the expense of my future fertility. There you go. You know, what about saunas? Are obviously very popular, and there's a lot of health benefits associated with saunas. I've definitely been a big advocate for sauna use. Saunas, yeah. obviously, whole body heat exposure, right? That's right. Yeah, you know, I love sauna as well. I love the benefits of sauna, and uh, there's been some some um, um, differing opinions on um, the quality of the data around the benefits of sauna. But I I think that it's very clear that there is at least some benefit to sauna use. Uh, I have a sauna at my house my bedroom. I love sauna in the evening before bed. It's a great way to, you know, when we look at, at uh, sleep hygiene, things that we can do to improve the quality of sleep or kind of prepare our bodies for sleep. I love sauna in, in that those last couple hours, that time frame before bed. Um, and so I, I, I love the benefits of sauna. I think that the benefits far outweigh the harm. Coming back to your, I think the question we're getting at here is, does that heat affect fertility affect testosterone production. And I don't think that the jury is really out on that yet. It, it, it makes sense from a logical standpoint that per, perhaps you're causing harm, but I think it may be the, the balance of, are we creating more benefit than harm? Yeah, it's also yeah. acute versus chronic, right? That's right. right. To sit in a sauna right. for one out of the 24 hours a day. Exactly, like, exactly. Not... And so I love sauna. I don't think it's really a major factor when it comes to affecting uh, testicular health or testosterone production and fertility. Yeah. Are you a fan of peptides? A lot of people are talking about peptide therapy these days. Love peptides. Peptides are amazing. Uh, peptides, uh, for the listeners, simply they're amino acids. They're short chains of amino acids. If you have uh, more than 100 amino acids in sequence, it's called a protein. And in less than 100 amino acids, it's simply called a, pro a peptide. So that's really the definition for the, for the lay people. Peptides can have amazing benefits uh, to um, add to everything else you're doing. So for example, uh, peptides can help improve uh, musculoskeletal repair. So um, I had tennis, tennis elbow. A couple of peptides were great for helping me with that recovery. There are peptides for cognitive focus, for anxiety, for reducing inflammation, whether it's in the gut or systemic or in joints, uh, you can reduce inflammation. Peptides for weight loss, for burning fat, for building muscle. Peptides for immune function. Back in 2020 when I had COVID, I, I uh, posted a blog article about the amazing benefit of uh, four different peptides that I use as a cocktail to help me quickly recover from COVID. Now, the FTC had comments about that we can talk about. Um, but nonetheless, the, the, the benefits of peptides are very clear. Uh, the science around the efficacy and safety of peptides are, in my opinion, very clear as well. They are a very powerful way to um, take a very personalized, individualized uh, perspective, a precision approach, if you will, on what you're trying to accomplish. Hmm. Any favorites? B BPC-157 always comes up. Yeah, BPC is a, a common one. Uh, that's kind of like the starter drug, if you will, the starter <laughs> peptide guys use. And that's great for inflammation. What are the, what are the deeper cuts? Yeah, right. Um, so uh, the oral version of BPC is great for gut inflammation. Um, it's. I remember one of the, the first clients I gave uh, BPC, this was, gosh, maybe five years ago or so now. 
he had massive reflux symptoms and he had tried all the typical stuff and nothing worked. And um, I gave him oral BPC. And I saw him a month later, Mike, how's your reflux symptoms? And he's like, what are you talking about, doc? I'm like, remember? He's like, I did? Completely forgot about it, completely went away, gone within a month. So there are a lot of um, powerful stories like that. Now, injectable BPC, subcutaneous injection, is great for musculoskeletal inflammation or systemic inflammation. And so BPC is a great one for inflammation. There are growth hormone peptides that we use a lot. Um, as we age, we know that our growth hormone levels decline, especially after the age of 40. And growth hormone is incredibly important when it comes to sleep quality, when it comes to body composition, burning fat, building muscle, um, cognitive function. And so peptides are a great way to help our body increase production of growth hormone without relying on exogenous, which we don't wanna do, giving growth hormone. And so there are great peptides that we can use to stimulate growth hormone production. And I love those. Um, they're peptides for immune function. Um, I mentioned I used several of these when I had, had uh, COVID. There is a, uh, a massive increase in autoimmune disease in our, um, in our population. A lot of it's related to gut health issues. And I think that um, immune system regulation is something that's not necessarily appreciated, but I think it's super important. So I love peptides for that. Peptides for sleep, peptides for anxiety, uh, C-Max, C-Link, uh, those are incredible. Um, there are some for mitochondrial function. So mot sc is one you probably haven't heard of. It's a great mitochondrial function. It's actually been shown to improve cardiovascular uh, risk parameters as well. So there are numerous peptides. Um, the interesting thing that has the development around peptides that has come up recently is uh, in September, late September, uh, really out of nowhere, the FDA came out and said that um, we can't um, confirm the safety of these peptides you're using, and so we're going to put them in the category two. Hmm. This is a big move because what that did is it basically made all compounding pharmacies, which is the, the, the only reputable source of good quality peptides is from a compounding pharmacy where you know that there's there's oversight, there's, there's Q&A, uh, excuse me, quality assurance, and you know you're getting what you think you're getting. They had to basically stop making most of them because of that change from the FDA. Now, why? Why did the FDA do that? When there are uh, dozens upon dozens of studies, scientific publications showing the safety and efficacy of these peptides. And this is where uh, I, I believe there has to be um, some financial motivations here. And we can look at big pharma, we can look at how drug companies uh, don't love peptides, don't like peptides, and how they actually, you know, look, if we're preventing chronic disease, you no longer need pharmaceuticals, right? You no longer need drugs. Yeah. And so it's not in their best interest for us to be healthy. And they don't teach us that in medical school. They don't teach us that as we're going through medical training, but it's so clear now that um, our, our entire broken healthcare system is based upon drugs. Mm -hmm. And we don't wanna prevent that, do we? And so uh, it, there's, um, there's an outroar right now in the medical community. We are putting together a consortium to uh, run a clinical trial to show and prove the safety and efficacy of these peptides. There's a lawsuit with the FDA underway currently as well to try to recover our ability to just simply source these amazing peptides that are again, nothing more than amino acids. Wow, and yeah. are peptides patentable? Is that why they are just so disinterested? There you go, there you go. Them? So because peptides are simply chains of amino acids, that they are generic by definition. You can't patent it when it's a, simply a sequence of amino acids. Hmm. A pharmaceutical you could patent, and therefore you can generate the money to go through 10 years of R&D and clinical, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three, three trials. There's not that kind of uh, research money there for trials related to peptides. And so that's one of the biggest problems that we have is that you don't have the money behind it like you do with pharma. Yeah. And like insulin is, a, is an example of a peptide, right? That's right. That's right. Wow. How did you get into all this? I mean, I, I know you you have a, a, an incredible background. You're a urologist. But at what point in your career did it did all these more holistic and yet still evidence-based um, approaches to uh, boosting hormonal, urologic health really come to the forefront for you as being yeah. important? So I was in a traditional medical practice. I was in a group urology practice in the hospital doing robotic surgery, doing kidney stones, vasectomies, doing typical bread and butter urology stuff every day, going through life until I hit a wall. 
And this was about 12 years ago in my practice where I woke up one day and overnight, I'm 30 pounds overweight. I'm stressed out. I'm not sleeping. Um, I um, am not exercising. Um, I am um, not a very happy guy. And um, I go to a traditional medical doctor, a concierge doc in Sarasota, Florida for my first ever physical. And uh, it wasn't good to say the least. And it was uh, a little scary to suddenly face your own mortality when you see a lot of bad numbers. And for me, the, the eye-opening moment was when he had no real answers for me. His answer was, um, lose weight, eat vegetables, and I might need to give you a statin if it doesn't get better. And I didn't know much then, and, and I like to humbly admit that, you know, as a men's health expert at the time, I, I didn't have any answers either. I, I didn't know what the hell to do. All I knew is that I, I was a mess. I needed to change things around, and I had a, my first son was, was on the way at that time. And so I started reading and studying and going to conferences and, and re-educating myself, and, and I found this whole world of epigenetics and precision medicine where you use genetics to guide, you know, uh, recommendations on lifestyle. And then I found the world of functional medicine and how you can look at the root cause, you know, the underlying source of the problem rather than just treating it with a drug. Then I found this whole world of peptide therapy. And I found this whole world of uh, the science around longevity and the science around how we can extend health span so that well, I'm not trying to get my clients to live to 150, but if I can get you to live to 100 and actually have a great quality of life until the day you die, that's really what it's all about. And so I started learning all this amazing new stuff that they don't teach you in medical school. They, they teach you, you know, diagnosis, drug, diagnosis, drug. And so I started applying these principles on my own self, on my own body, and everything started changing. And I suddenly um, liked who I was again, started losing weight. Um, my wife started liking me again for a while there. It was a little, <laughs> little touch and go. Um, but it really changed everything for me personally, and I found my passion again. And, and I had, at that point, become very disillusioned with traditional healthcare, disillusioned with, um, am I going to do this for the rest of my life when I'm so miserable? How, you know, how does that reflect on my patient care when I am not loving and enjoying and fully embracing what I'm doing here, when I've now found this whole new way of approaching health and performance and, and longevity? And so it was a light switch in my mind where I'm, I, I'm, I'm moving forward with this new world. And so I started uh, applying these principles with my patients and my urology practice on the side, and they were seeing great results as well. And, and that's when I really knew that I, I had to jump off that cliff one day and, and step into this new role. And, um, and I spent years preparing for that. And about um, four years ago now, I gave my group notice I'm leaving. And my colleagues, my traditional medical colleagues, all thought I was batshit crazy. Hmm. And now they're asking me, how do you do what you do? How, how do you love medicine again? How do you love um, impacting men's lives again? And um, and our healthcare system is broken. It's so obvious how most doctors in this country are unhappy. They're miserable. They um, they don't like what they're doing, but they're stuck. And um, they're simply pill pushers. Hmm. And so for me, it's not just about my own health and being the best dad I can be. It's not just about training other practitioners now. It's about really redefining healthcare and redefining how we think about health and, um, and taking a very different approach. Yeah, it's so important. I mean, we yeah. were just watching, uh, you know, I was on, I got to do the Today Show and, you know, it just, it, but when you watch these morning TV shows, which, you know, and I love doing morning TV and I, you know, it's a, it's a, I, I hope that, that, that these kinds of programs continue to persist. And, you know, I think they, they do, you know, add such value to the public, but it, it is fascinating that the ads, like in between the segments, right, the ads on TV during the morning hours are all for pharmaceutical drugs. Mm -hmm. They're all for pharmaceutical drugs. Yeah. And a lot of the public um, has this negative perception toward traditional medical doctors that there's a, a financial incentive and that they're just prescribing drugs because they're getting paid by the drug companies. That can't be farther from the truth. They, the drug companies can't even give us a pen anymore. They, the drug companies are so regulated. They used to take us to golf trips and all that, throw money around and, and, and spending like crazy. Now they're so regulated. They can't give us anything, even a pen without um, uh, oversight of why did you do that. And and so I, I don't think it's through um, um, any negative, harmful intent by uh, any malicious intent by medical doctors. I think it comes down to the fact that we are brainwashed. 
Hmm. When we go through our medical education, our medical school training, at that very early stage in our development, we are simply taught, find the diagnosis. It was the ICD-9 code then, now it's the ICD-10 code. And this is the pharmaceutical that you use to treat it. We would get so much of our education from drug reps telling us how you treat this problem with this drug. And so that's ingrained in our mind from the very beginning. Um, what's unfortunate is we get not one hour of um, education on nutrition, not one hour of education on fitness, nothing on sleep, nothing on stress, on the incredibly negative effects and impacts of our, on our health from stress, nothing. And so we need to change that. And um, it comes from the top down. And if we can't get our, our healthcare system to focus on these things that matter and are looking at the key data points that we know truly drive health, then we're never going to make a difference. It's so true. Yeah. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, that's why I'm so grateful for the time that we live in now where we get to, you know, create things like podcasts and, and, and you know, go on stages around the world, create social media platforms and, and, and allow experts such as, as yourself to advocate, you know, for these topics, which otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't get, wouldn't be able to get out there, right? Like prior generations, you know, I think prior generations were their, the, the extent to their knowledge of these kinds of topics was relegated to whatever the mainstream media would decide mm -hmm. to pick up, you know? And, um, and so, yeah, I think it's it's amazing that we live in such an empowering time where this information really has become, in a way, democratized. But still, it needs to get you know it needs to break out of the echo chambers and 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 affect the people and reach the people that really need to hear it the most. Right. You know, because I feel like it's still yeah. the message is still getting lost on the more you know marginalized groups, people in the in the in the margins. Sure. And I I think that there's still a role for traditional healthcare. You have a heart attack you have a kidney stone, you have some sort of emergency, you still need traditional medical care to help you with that. Yeah. But we're getting into this, um, this era where the information is out there now to suddenly recognize that there's so much more. And this is where I, I love the concept of empowering the public to take control of your health, to own it and embrace it. And, and, um, uh, you know, look for the diagnostic tests that you can do to identify those blind spots. Use personalized data to, again, understand what's right for me. Instead of going to Twitter and finding out what I should be eating, use your data to understand if what you're doing is working or not. And that's how you can design, if you will, the lifestyle and the behaviors and, and the supplement um, uh, profile or the, the hormones or peptides that you're taking that's specifically right for you. Yeah, we, need, yeah. we, we definitely need traditional healthcare. And I actually, yeah. I personally, I had a urologic emergency a couple of years ago, about 10 years ago, I experienced two instances of testicular torsion, intermittent testicular torsion. I woke up both times. It was upon waking. One of my nuts was torsed, was twisted, and it was the most painful thing I'd ever endured. And the first time it went away on its own, the second time it didn't go away on its own. Like it, it nat the first time it naturally like untwisted <laughs> and the second, but the second time it didn't. So I literally, I like crawled down to my garage, got in my car, and somehow was able to drive myself to the emergency room here in Los Angeles, Cedar Sinai. And uh, and yeah, the, the staff there was incredible. And I ultimately needed a procedure, a, a procedure called an orchiopexy, which basically prevented that from ever happening again. It hasn't happened since in 10 years. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. That was, but that's, you know, that was a testament to the power of healthcare. Sure. You know, when we need it in sure. the right time and place. That's right. Yeah. And and no supplement or, or nutrition plan is gonna gonna help you in that situation. Exactly. So there's still a role for it, but but we're we're clearly coming to a, a point in in the evolution of healthcare in this U in, in the US here where things have to change and start taking an integrative approach, a comprehensive approach, rather than just simply uh, assuming that our healthcare system is there for us because I, I'm now ashamed to recognize that we're not and and we need to take a very different perspective. Yeah. yeah. So what would you say are the three things that every man listening to this should do starting today to optimize their sexual hormonal health? Sure. Number one, get tested. Get the advanced diagnostics that are going to move the needle. And what I mean by that is what are the lab tests that you need to look for the key factors, the key drivers that may affect sexual health, metabolic health, ability to burn fat, build muscle, have cognitive function, all the things that, that guys care about. Obviously. So from a hormone standpoint, you yeah. want your total testosterone, but impo more importantly, you want your free testosterone. That's right. 
Is there value in testing sex hormone binding globulin? Sure. Yeah, I think it's a, it's uh, helpful to understand that. Uh, there are not a lot of great ways to artificially lower sex hormone binding globulin other than actually giving testosterone may lower that. Um, things like stinging nettle may help with that. Uh, there are some other peptides or, or synthetic chemicals that can lower that. But I, I don't I don't like driving that down. I like bringing the free T up instead. Yeah. So looking at things like free testosterone, looking at uh, thyroid hormone. Uh, it, it's generally thought of uh, as a female hormone, but it's critically important for men as well. And so we want to be looking at the free T3 and the free T4, which are the active forms of thyroid hormone. Uh, our traditional healthcare system looks at TSH, which is the signal from our brain that tells the thyroid to make hormone. And when TSH looks okay, when it's in that normal range, they tell you you're fine, but you're, you're missing half the story when you do that. And so looking at thyroid hormone, uh, DHEA. DHEA sulfate specifically is the active form of DHEA, which is a, a precursor to testosterone and also uh, an importantly uh, a powerful hormone when it comes to mood and energy and sleep uh, and stuff like that. So DHEA is important. Um, we can look at markers of inflammation, things like CRP, myeloperoxidase, that's looking at um, our systemic inflammation. Markers of blood sugar regulation. So one of the most important labs that I like to look at is a fasting insulin test. Hmm. Uh, fasting insulin is going to look at how your body is um, is regulating blood sugar. And uh, for a lot of guys, when they're having issues with energy and cognitive function um, and inability to, to burn fat, especially around the belly, it comes down to blood sugar regulation. And you can see that with a fasting insulin level, and you can see that with a hemoglobin A1C. That's more of a, a longer term, a 90-day window into how well you've been managing blood sugar. Um, so those are super important. Uh, I think that the, the cholesterol, you know, we, we could have a whole hour long conversation on that. I think that it's important to understand your ApoB and understand your LDL particle number, understand your LP little a, which is more the genetically inherited one. Now, what do you do with those? That's a different story. And I know we've talked about that on great podcast previously. Um, the triglyceride to HDL ratio is certainly important as well. That's more looking at, uh, again, blood sugar regulation and how that's affecting uh, lipid numbers. In general, you want your HDL high, you want your triglycerides that's low. Right. That's right. Exactly. And so those are some, some starting points when it comes to what can men do to take charge is number one, get the, get the diagnostic test on, see where you are. Um, and at least that's a good starting point. And, and there's a lot of other things we can do testing wise. Um, but for men at home, I think that's a great start. Number two would be track your data. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, one size fails all. How do you track data? Well, you can look at, uh, devices, tools, wearables that you can use to measure things that we're talking about here. So we're looking at things like stress, like guys say, I'm not stressed. Okay, let's look at the data. You can measure heart rate variability. And I, I think that it's important to, to take a moment to talk about how do you measure heart rate variability. The key is, and I know you've talked about this in previous shows, heart rate variability is simply the variation in your heartbeat from one beat to the next. And we want a higher heart rate variability, which shows that our, our parasympathetic system is dominating, that we have dynamic flexibility to adapt to whatever the environment is. You can measure that directly with a Garmin, an Apple, an Aura, a Fitbit, a Whoop, all these devices, you can measure it. However, those are measuring it throughout a 24-hour time period and giving you the average of that period. Well, that's not necessarily helpful because our days vary so much. Today, I may do a heavy leg workout. Tomorrow, I may do a low intensity walk. Um, one day, I may be particularly stressed because of um, something that's happening at work. The other day, I may have slept poorly. Um, what you want to look at is HRV from one specific snapshot in time, apples to apples, day to day. And so what I do, I wake up at six in the morning and the very first thing I do is I sit down and I put on my strap. I use the Polar H10 strap, it's, it's very inexpensive, connected to my Elite HRV app on my phone, it's free. And I, for two and a half minutes, I'll run my, my readiness score. Hmm. And now I have an HRV that I can compare from day to day and I'll see the difference. So for example, I, I took the red eye or the late night flight to get here last night and my HRV this morning was in the tank. Of course, and because of the stress of travel and the time zone changes and all that, that's expected. If I were to look at a whole snapshot in time of yesterday where I might have had a heavy workout and today I flew, they may look identical when in fact they're very, very different because of the context. So the key is context there. You could track sleep. There are a lot of different devices to look at sleep and, and uh, we don't necessarily care so much about the quantity of sleep, it's more the quality. And by that I mean looking at the specific stages. So 
as I mentioned earlier, deep sleep and REM sleep, those are, are the two most important stages when it comes to the repair and recovery and the restore aspect of sleep. And we want an hour of deep sleep and we want two hours of REM sleep, give or take. Okay, so those are kind of good targets. Got it. A lot of the devices are not very accurate. So you look at, you know, any watch, uh, it moves, any wristband, it moves around and you're going to get um, some inaccuracies because of that. The Aura, and I have no financial incentive here, but the Aura is by far the most validated device on the market. Hmm. There have been studies that have clearly shown that it correlates with polysomnography data, sleep study data, as the most accurate way of measuring those stages of sleep. Wow, I didn't realize that. Yeah. So... Track it however you like. Use whatever device you want, but know that if you're wearing anything that's um, that's like a mattress or a wristband, that it's never going to be 100% accurate. You know, nothing is other than a sleep study. But the Aura is pretty damn close. Hmm. I um, actually, I have an Aura and no financial affiliation with yeah. either Aura yeah. or 8Sleep. Actually, 8Sleep used to sponsor us in the past, but they don't currently. Um, but I have it, and it's been a game changer for my sleep because I tend to sleep hot. Yeah. Um, but the reason why I bring it up is because I, I have found that the Aura and the 8 Sleep correlate pretty tightly in terms of, like if the Aura says that I've had a good quality night of sleep, yeah. my, the mattress tends to corroborate that. The 8 yeah. Sleep tracks you automatically, Yeah, which is pretty cool. And I've, I've played around with that where I'll wear an Aura and the Garmin or Aura and Apple or Whoop, and, and I'll compare them. And sometimes they're spot on, sometimes they're totally um, different mm -hmm. data, and then you have to wonder which one's right. And I tend to lean on the Aura for that. Yeah. Mm. Very interesting. Is there any value in measuring uh, nighttime erection strength? So, good question. So, nighttime erections are uh, fairly consistently tied to your testosterone levels. And so, there are, are studies that they put a little um, a stamp almost uh, around the, the penis and they measure um, um, the, the, the change in erections, uh, the change in girth basically overnight. I don't find that there's any value in um, the general public doing that on a consistent basis. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's that's necessarily something that should drive your decisions, your healthcare decisions. I think checking those free T levels to me is probably the most important and understanding how that's a, impacting your quality of life. So f you mentioned your free T is 180. For some men, they may be great at 160. Other guys, they may need up to 250. Hmm. And so the key is to correlate that number with your response, how you feeling, energy, cognitive function, um, your your workout capacity, and your sexual drive and sexual performance. Yeah. But there's this lore, you know, that guys wake up with like morning erections. I yeah. actually have never, like I, I rarely, I don't think I've ever woken up with like a morning erection. Like yeah. it's, it's something that like probably happens overnight for me. But, um, but yeah, it's just not a, a thing for me, but I, you hear constantly the concept of like morning wood, like people right. just wake up with erections. But the only reason why I bring it up, not to, you know, share too much information with my audience or shame or shame <laughs> myself publicly, but there is bio individuality here, right. which I think is so important to underscore. That's right. Yeah. So uh, men who wake up with a morning erection, that, that's a great sign that your testosterone levels are probably close to where they need to be. But the opposite does not hold true that if I don't wake up with a morning erection, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're off. It means that you should get checked and see where you are. And, and obviously you've already done that. So yeah, my yeah. testosterone levels are great. Yeah. And I don't have a problem in that department yeah. when yeah. the time comes, you know, right. when, I, yeah. when I need those resources, right. so to speak. Now you're 40 though. So come back and talk to me when you're 45. Yeah. And that tends to be the time between 40 and 45 or so is when most men start to experience that change. Hmm. And uh, they talk about uh, this concept of andropause, which is like when women go through menopause. Uh, there's a clear change that happens in men um, between 40 and 45 or maybe between 45 to 50. It depends on, on the individual where everything starts to change and hormone production starts to decline. Uh, sleep quality may start to decline, and um, a, a lot of other biomarkers tend to change around that time. And and that's when men start to experience a lot of the symptoms of aging. And so just be aware that as great as you are right now, when you turn, when you get toward 45, things may look very different. And is TRT recommended? Great question. So um, we do a lot of TRT at Gappin Institute. And I think that there are amazing benefits of getting your testosterone levels to where they need to be for men who need it. So if your free T was 113, for example, I mentioned earlier all of the lifestyle maneuvers that we can employ to try to get that up, right? That 113 may get to 130, 140, let's just say. 
And that's, that's what I found in my clinical practice over the years is that the natural approaches are, are so important for other reasons, but specifically raising testosterone, they don't tend to move the needle enough. And so I can say, look, Max, your T level is not where it needs to be. Your body's not making enough of it. We've tried the natural approaches. It's not getting you there. One way or the other, we need to get your testosterone levels optimized because of, again, cardiovascular benefit, because of body composition, insulin sensitivity, all the benefits that we've talked about. Vigor, mental health, well-being, yeah, all that like stuff. Yeah, the, like the, the, the benefits massively outweigh any minimal negligible risk of testosterone therapy if done properly, of course. Great. Yeah. And so, yeah, so I, I recommend for most men that have low testosterone, let's definitely um, leverage all of these lifestyle factors that are so important, but also, and let's look at TRT as well. And how is that dose typically? Is it like one shot every couple of months or like, how does it work? So we typically think of it as the more often, the better. So when I was back in my uh, previous life as a urologist, um, we were taught just give them every two weeks, give them a shot. Hmm. And that can't be more wrong because what happens is you give a shot and the levels spike up very high. And then over time they dwindle back down and then a week or so later they're in the tank again. Mm. And then you give them a shot massively it goes up and then it comes back down again. And so you spend so much time in that two week interval, either way above where you need to be or below where you need to be that you're really, you're, you're missing the benefit. Mm. Whereas if you do it more often, so we typically recommend like twice a week, maybe even three times a week if, if a guy's able to, when they dose it that often, now you're able to get very consistent levels and you have, uh, you have basically the entire time you're in that therapeutic window where you need to be. Wow. And so, um, so that's the nuance of it. That's where there's a lot of uh, malpractice being done in, in testosterone therapy where you need to understand um, the pharmacokinetics and, and the half-life of it and, and be checking levels regularly to, to fine tune it and tweak it just right. Brilliant. And what kind yeah. of syringe are we talking about? Is it one of these like small insulin needles or is yeah. it? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, we typically, uh, for most men, we recommend subcutaneous injection and, and that's very different from in the past. It was all intramuscular mm. and, and we thought it has to be intramuscular. So in a shot in the butt is how we would do it. Uh, we learned maybe five years ago or so we learned that remarkably subcutaneous testosterone injection gives the same levels for most men. There are maybe two or 3% of men that don't respond the same, but most men will um, get adequate levels uh, with subcutaneous injection. So we'll use like a 27, 28 gauge uh, insulin needle. You don't feel it. But you can do that yourself, can't you? You do it like yourself. Yeah, yeah, you do it right here in the belly, just next to the belly button. And uh, I'm on testosterone therapy myself. I do it twice a week, just like my, wow. my patients do, and don't feel it at all. And it's super simple. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if the time come, can't ever, if the time came where I needed that, which yeah. I'm sure it will at some point, then I would feel no shame about doing it. Yeah sounds like it's all, you know, very, all upside, very little downside. That's right. What about peeing at night? Waking up at night to pee. I wake up every single night to pee, usually once, sometimes twice. Okay. I do like to drink water before bed. I will say that. Yeah. But um, any solutions for those of us who want to sure. do that less? So in my former life, you would come in the urology office and you tell me how I'm waking up a lot at night. And I'm fine during the day, but waking up at night. Well, there's a great pharmaceutical for that. Let me prescribe that for you and see how you do. That, that that's the traditional approach. Now, very different. Now we recognize how your lifestyle and behavior can directly impact that. And so, um, a lot of times it's fluid intake in the evening. And so, um, for a lot of guys, it's being sure that after dinner that you don't drink anything else, mm. especially anything with caffeine in it. But uh, because we know that can stimulate the bladder uh, contractility, so avoiding fluid intake any anytime after dinner if you need to take a sip of water for your pills if you're taking supplements that's okay but in general avoid fluid intake um alcohol and caffeine are the things that i would definitely avoid um spicy foods can actually uh, stimulate bladder contractility as well so mm. we want to avoid spicy foods and and notice how sometimes um spicy foods at dinner can sometimes affect that overnight a lot of times though the reality of it is that most men who wake up at night to pee you're not waking up because you have to pee. And um, this may or may not be true for you, but for most men that I would see for this complaint, actually what's happening is they're waking up in the middle of the night because of cortisol issues and the sleep cycle and uh, they don't have good, again, we talked about the quality of sleep that's so important. They're waking up at night because of cortisol stress imbalance 
And as soon as you wake up, you actually have a reflex in your brain that tells you, I got to pee. Hmm. And so I ask men, when you wake up in the middle of the night, um, how much did you go? And a lot of times, like, yeah, I just went just a little bit as opposed to like a full void. And when that's the case, it's typically not that that was waking you up. Mm. I pee. I mean, I have full void, Yeah, I guess is the yeah. term. Yeah, I, I pee. It's definitely for me. I do enjoy drinking water at night. Yeah, I, I, I would limit that. And just that alone can make a big difference. Yeah. yeah. Our bodies have this hormone, antidiuretic hormone. And our ADH, antidiuretic hormone levels, vary throughout the day. And our bodies actually make more urine overnight. And so if you are drinking more water in the evening, you're making that potentially worse. I don't have this issue, but I do remember watching a YouTube video that said that for some constipation can actually cause uh, the feeling of constant uh, need to urinate. Yeah. Is that true? Like yes. it's like the, the rectum and the bladder are like super close or something like that. And the, so it's like you could actually be, yeah, there's yeah, like crosstalk, that's intentional right. crosstalk. The, well, they're right next to each other and they share the same nerves. And so a lot of times the sensation is very similar. And you'll notice, you know, when you have a bowel movement, you'll urinate at the same time as well often because you're relaxing through those nerves. You're relaxing your whole pelvic floor. And so, yes, men who have issues with chronic constipation, that will often cause issues of overactive bladder with increased frequency and urgency and nighttime urination that's fascinating yeah wow this brings back urology stuff here dude i love it life. dude well this is uh super enlightening i feel like we could keep going but um i want to be i know that you've got you know you came all this way and you flew overnight red eye and i want to be respectful of your time but um i've learned a lot man this was super fun awesome yeah uh one last question for you but before we get to that where can people find you on social media how can they connect with you support your work uh, thanks so much so yeah. we're on linkedin and instagram and uh facebook gapin institute or dr tracy gapin dope well dr gapin last question for everybody on the show what does living a genius life mean to you living with intention um you know we have this capacity to embrace and own and control our health and it's about the micro decisions you make on a daily basis. And it's about creating the consistency in your life. And um, a lot of men, it, it's a matter of living with intention and making the small baby steps, the tiny habits each day that are going to add up over time and make real change. Love that. Beautifully put. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there.